Yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and I too want to thank the organizers for the Tohoku Creativity Forum. I've learned a great deal. It's been a pleasure to be here and uh, to participate and to learn from you. Um, I wanted to mention before I get started that uh, there will be a meeting held uh, next year and uh, I'd like to bring this to your attention in July of 2018 in the state that I'm from in the United States in New Mexico in the city of Santa Fe and uh, this is a meeting of the International Society of Developmental and Comparative Immunology. There's a website if you want to know more. And this particular society is interested in all things immunological, comparative, evolutionary. So some of my students who work on snail immunobiology would be there. Uh, but I know some of you have an interest in bivalve immunology. Uh, some of you may have an interest in the immunology of fish and vaccines, which we'll hear about shortly. Uh, plant immunology, uh, plant immunologists are welcome. And in fact, we always enjoy hearing about plant immunology because uh, so much progress has been made in understanding plant immunology. And then uh, also non-traditional mammalian systems uh, you might hear about the immunology of a duck-billed platypus or an opossum or a Tasmanian devil. Uh, you don't hear so much mouse immunology at this meeting, uh, but for some of you who have an interest in uh, the immunobiology of animals of veterinary significance, uh, this meeting uh, could be uh, of interest to you. And it might be a good venue for scientists associated with the CFAI program uh, to come and participate. And Santa Fe is an interesting city. Uh, it's a hub in the art world. If you're interested in Native American culture, uh, it's an interesting place to come. And also, if you like just getting in a car and driving out in wide open spaces under a beautiful uh, blue western sky, uh, it's also a very pleasant place to come. So uh, I would like to encourage you to keep this meeting in mind as something uh, if you have an interest in evolutionary immunology. So uh, today I'm going to break the mold a bit and not talk about immunobiology, uh, which I often do, but today I'm not. And I hope you will bear with me as I try to uh, lead you down a few alleys uh, perhaps that you don't think about very often and uh, think about certain uh, biological aspects from a different point of view. So first of all, we live in this uh, marvelously diverse biological world with many different species. And uh, even though, sadly, uh, we hear and see articles like this all the time. Uh, nonetheless, we live in an amazingly diverse uh, environment. And uh, one of the themes that has emerged of interest to uh, people uh, who care about infectious disease is the interaction between biodiversity and the transmission of human infectious diseases. And I think it's fair to say right now that there's a lot of divided opinion about how a biodiversity in the environment influences disease transmission. Uh, here's one prominent idea called the dilution effect where diverse host communities uh, inhibit uh, parasite abundance by regulating populations of susceptible hosts or by interfering with transmission. And according to this idea, the loss of biodiversity then may uh, worsen disease transmission, uh, infectious diseases of, of people. And then by contrast, we have another point of view that biodiversity might actually promote disease transmission by providing more different uh, alternative host species and thus options for transmission 
or because these diverse hosts have more parasites that could emerge themselves to become problematic. And uh, this is sort of the general kind of uh, framework or idea we've been thinking about in my lab for the last few years uh, in reference to a particular human infectious disease that I'll tell you more about here shortly. Now, the other theme that I would try to uh, like to try to work into this talk is also a theme of agriculture. And uh, agriculture, including domestication of animals, has had a huge impact on the planet's surface, perhaps more than any other human activity. And I was reminded of this just recently when I took the train from Tokyo to Sendai, uh, how much of the uh, land uh, between the cities is under cultivation from rice. And the same would be true in many parts of the United States or Kenya or wherever you might be. And uh, another thing that I want to point out is how the domestication of animals has uh, really interwoven the course of infectious disease of animals and humans to a very uh, astonishing degree. And the infectious disease that I want to try to relate these ideas to is uh, human schistosomiasis, and in particular caused by schistosoma mansoni, and in uh, particular, a certain location in and around Lake Victoria on the equator in Africa. Uh, here's the lake right here. And this is one of the world's great endemic foci of infection, uh, people getting uh, infected by contact with the water. As uh, Dr. Takahashi alluded to, uh, in this particular case, by Ampullaria snails being involved in the transmission of this particular parasite. And just let me digress for a moment to give you a little bit of background about the biology of these worms. In my own opinion, highly biased, of course, they're uh, incredibly unique and interesting creatures. Uh, we're looking at worms like this that are maybe about that long, tops. Uh, they're platyhelminths. Their digenetic trematodes or flukes in a particular family, the Schistosomatidae, and they're peculiar for being dioecious. There is a separate male and a female sex, and the name Schistosome refers to the split body of the male in which it holds a female in permanent copulation. And because these worms live within the vertebrate vascular system, they are called blood flukes. And they have a very distinctive two-host life cycle that involves snails, like the ones you see here. And in these snails are produced cercaria that come out of the snail and penetrate the skin of a human host like this to perpetuate the infection. And uh, schistosomes to this day probably infect around 250 million people uh, it is one of the most common uh, neglected tropical diseases out there, uh, again, uh, very close to malaria and uh, also uh, geohelminths uh, with their uh, prevalence. And the life cycle of the parasite you see here, uh, imagine we have a child that's infected and often children are the victims. Uh, the adult worms would be found in the blood vessels of the child. The worms produce eggs of a very characteristic lateral spine on them that pass in the feces of the child. If the egg gets into fresh water, it will hatch and will release a myricidium stage like you see here that will penetrate a freshwater snail. And in this case, as Dr. Takahashi alluded to, uh, snails only in the genus Biampolaria, like the ones that you see here, uh, are susceptible to infection. Over a period of about a month of proliferative asexual development in the snail, and then eventually cercaria like this are produced. And these cercaria have a forked tail. They swim through the water, and they would penetrate the skin of a child as the child enters the water to perpetuate the infection. 
and these cercaria can be produced by the thousands and are very talented at being able to find and penetrate human skin now dr. takahashi also alluded to the life cycle of schistosoma japonicum which is very similar one difference being whereas mansoni is primarily a human parasite uh, Japonicum is found both in humans and many other mammalian species. And uh, as he mentioned, Japonicum has its own distinctive snail host, in this case of the genus Oncomelania. But otherwise, many parts of the life cycle are the same. And here, I again would like to acknowledge a very seminal contribution made by a Japanese parasitologist in 1913. Uh, Professor Miyari was the first person to identify that Miracidia that come from an egg uh, will attack and penetrate uh, a freshwater snail like Oncomelania. And uh, given that these Oncomelania snails are very small, uh, that was an amazing accomplishment at the time. And I love the way he described it. Uh, he described the Miracidium being like a tiger that comes out and ferociously attacks a snail and penetrates it to initiate that part of the life cycle. Now, uh, there are at least five species that infect humans. Uh, people can accumulate a large number of worms, 1,000, uh, 10,000 worm pairs potentially. The egg counts of these uh, parasites in the feces can be very high. Uh, there's often extensive damage to the liver, to the vascular system. You often see the eggs encased in a granuloma response like this. And this is a disease that has impacted people for a long time. Uh, some of the mummies that have been examined in Egypt show clear evidence of, of having been infected with these parasites. And uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, I think the Tour de France was recently concluded uh, yesterday, and uh, one of the headlines that was generated by the Tour de France is the person who won it. Uh, cyclist overcomes rare parasitic disease before winning Tour de France four times. Uh, the rare parasitic disease that they're referring to here is just the somiasis. It's really not so rare, though, because it might be rare among cyclists in the Tour de France, but uh, there's probably, uh, like I said, about 250 million people 90% of whom live in sub-Saharan Africa that are still infected. Uh, now, these parasites are very hard to control, and the question is why? And for one thing, these tiny little adult worms live a long time in their human host. Uh, they may live for five or 10 years. In some cases, they can live for decades in the human host. And the other thing is, as you see in this image, an infected snail can produce a huge number of these cercaria. And this production of cercaria can continue for several months. And here's just one example where in Kenya, uh, we were able to follow some snails like this one right here that continued to produce these infective cercaria for over a year before they finally uh, succumbed to the infection. So there's a lot in this life cycle that makes them stable and very hard to control. And in parts of Kenya, uh, and it, indeed around Lake Victoria, uh, these are just some of the study sites where we have worked in the past. And you see prevalence of infections shown here in some of these villages of 46, 84, 72%, et cetera. Very high prevalence rates in children. And this is even after four or more years of control of these, attempted control of these parasites. Uh, this just shows uh, a data from the SCORE project that's funded by the Gates Foundation, where after repeated years of chemotherapy, the prevalence of infection in many of these villages really is very hard to push lower and lower. So uh, there is a lot of difficulty in reducing the uh, prevalence of infection with these parasites. <laughs> Difficult to control.
Uh, part of what we've been doing in Kenya over the last several years is trying to identify some of the locations where the disease is actually transmitted. And perennial streams like the ones you see here are uh, part of the story. And in those streams along the margins, uh, you can find a particular snail here called Biomphalaria pfeifferi that is uh, involved in the transmission of, of Schistosoma mansoni, the parasite that I showed you the life cycle for. And here I just want to digress briefly to show you this uh, image right here. And I think a lot about this image. Uh, if you look at it, it really sort of is a window, a glimpse of a kind of world that exists in parts of rural Africa very commonly that seems unthinkable to us in many ways because uh, what we have is one of these perennial streams and if you'll look what we have here are women drawn to the stream they're washing their clothes and literally right next to them uh, is a cow that's uh, drinking water from the same stream and by the way uh, if there is a model needed for a drug-free cow, I would bet my last dollar that some of these cattle have never been exposed to antibiotics whatsoever. They're just uh, free-ranging animals. And the other thing, too, is that uh, it's, it's interesting that it's water, of course, that draws humans and cattle together in an environment like this. Now, the cattle themselves are not susceptible to this particular parasite, but nonetheless, they're there. And just uh, one other insight about a stream like this. Uh, some of my students have done metagenomic studies on some of the snails, these biomphalaria, the snails that live along the edge of the stream. And of course, when you do that, you get a tremendous variety of sequences back from the environment. And among uh, the most common sequences we got coming back as contaminants uh, from the snail metagenomic study was a bovine diarrhea virus. So uh, a habitat like this receives a tremendous load of contamination from the feces of cattle and also humans. And uh, again, uh, a stream like this not only used uh, by people for washing clothes, but that's where they get their drinking water. So they're routinely drinking water that has a tremendous variety of different kinds of biological entities uh, in it. I think it's a very interesting perspective on how uh, life occurs in certain parts of rural Africa. And again, in a stream habitat like this, it can be a very dangerous place. Uh, here you see a, a, a cage full of sentinel mice. There's a half a dozen mice in that cage, or I guess five of them. And uh, we put the mice into the water for a few hours. And imagine the cercaria coming out of the snail, and they're attracted to these mice. And we do this just to get a feel for how intensive transmission can be in these streams. And what we have discovered is that uh, these mice will accumulate as many as one worm per minute uh, while they're resident there floating on the water in these streams. So the transmission of infection in these locations can be very high. Uh, another kind of transmission site is a stream that's ephemeral. Uh, also is one that harbors Biomphalaria pfeifferi. But then it's clear that in this part of the world, we also have other kinds of habitats, like along the shore of the lake itself, where a different kind of Biomphalaria snail, Biomphalaria sudanica, exists and is also involved in the transmission of S. mansoni. And here you see the sudanica shell. So unlike many places where there's only a single species of Biomphalaria involved in transmission, here we have uh, not only two, but then even a third one. Uh, if you go offshore and dredge in deeper water off the shore of the lake down to a depth of about 12 meters, uh, you can find a third Biomphalaria species called Biomphalaria coenopola that's also there and transmitting S. mansoni. <laughs> 
And part of what uh, one of our Kenyan students, Martin Matuku, has been working on is to document, in fact, that all three of these species are uh, susceptible to infection with uh, schistosomes, uh, some more than others, but all are perfectly capable of taking the infection and shedding cercaria and being involved in transmission. So then what we have here in this location are three different Biomphalaria species present in different habitats, creating different opportunities for transmission and uh, something that's favoring the persistence of S. mansoni. So uh, keep that in mind for a moment. Uh, another thing that we were interested in is in and around this area is if S. mansoni were only found uh, in uh, humans. And we have done survey work of small mammals in marshes near Kisumu, which is where our, our studies are focused. And here's one study of 400 and different, uh, 480 different small mammals that were uh, caught. Uh, the overall prevalence of, of schistosomes uh, in these animals was 5.4%. And in particular, one species, Mastomys natalensis, the multi mammate mouse here, uh, the prevalence of S. mansoni in these mice was uh, about 7.5%. And uh, these mice can support the full development of S. mansoni and can the worms can mature to develop and develop eggs in these small mammals. So if you extrapolate a little bit in terms of the extensive area of the habitats occupied by these mice in and around the lake, just around the town of Kisumu, uh, and uh, use the infection rate that we found in our surveys, what you can determine is the populations of infected uh, mice that are found in the location can be uh, pretty high. So uh, even though these mice are small compared to humans, their populations are very large. And uh, if you think about it, these mice could be of significance in areas where uh, control programs are underway. The control program might do very well in eliminating schistosomiasis from people, but they're never going to do anything about the worms that are being transmitted by these mice, which then can serve to maintain transmission and a source of reinfections to people. So to get back to my theme of biodiversity, uh, the way we normally conceptualize the life cycle of this parasite is shown here. But if you think about what I've just told you, it really gets a little more involved because here in this particular part of Kenya, we have three different species living in very different environments that can be involved in transmission. And we have alternative mammalian hosts involved. And you can look at this particular situation and say, OK, the availability of different species is something where biodiversity is actually favoring transmission of S. mansoni, uh, if you think about it from, from this point of view. So the presence of alternative intermediate and definitive host species creates distinct opportunities for transmission in contexts that may allow the parasite to withstand control. So next, I want to just take a, a look at other ways in which the presence of diverse host species might influence transmission as well. So again, uh, here's our standard conception of how the life cycle is normally considered. But in the environments in which uh, schistosomiasis actually occurs, there is a tremendous variety of different mollusks that are present. And here's just some of them that I've shown here. And uh, all of these species, almost all of them, are really dead-end hosts for S. mansoni myricidia. And we can think of them as being decoys or sponges or sinks that potentially disfavor transmission. So imagine an egg coming from a child, hatching, myricidia being produced, uh, the myricidia going into all these different snails here, and um, the, the Myricidia failing. Uh, they're not going to develop in these snails, except right up here in this one. 
This is the only one in which uh, cercaria will actually be produced. So then only biampillaria snails can support uh, the transmission. And we can think in this particular case of all these diverse snails being present. Can you see that pointer OK? Because I can't see it. Can you see it all right? Um, here where we have snail diversity is disfavoring transmission. Uh, but the magnitude of this effect, this decoy effect, is really unknown. And if you think about this, if you're sort of with me and thinking about it, the same thing could apply for these cercaria. Some of the cercaria that are coming out of the snails could be penetrating the legs of cows or dogs or whatever, and maybe taken out of the picture that way because uh, they will not develop in those animals, only in people or some small, small rodents. So then we can imagine uh, here's another way that biodiversity is impacting transmission. Uh, then we can think about biodiversity in yet another way. Uh, we can think that if this parasite can at least get into biampillaria, then it's going to be safe. It has an opportunity to develop cercaria. But one of the things that we've been uh, working on and trying to flesh out in these habitats in Kenya is no, it's not quite that simple. Because actually, in fact, there are numerous species of trematodes that are found in the habitat that also depend on this very same snail, Biomphalaria, and can colonize that snail effectively. So we may have uh, trematode life cycles that are taking place in cattle or amphibians or birds or fish that all impact on that same, require ultimately that same host to be present. And what we can see here is that competition among all these different parasites can, uh, can actually diminish the opportunities for cercaria production uh, coming from S. mansoni. So here is an example where the biodiversity of the parasites themselves could disfavor transmission of S. mansoni. And uh, also think about what might happen if we're in the process of losing biodiversity. For whatever reason, particular amphibians or birds might drop out of the picture. Then if that were to happen, then the competition among uh, these various parasites for access to biomphalaria would diminish. And that loss of biodiversity then would potentially favor enhanced transmission of, of S. mansoni. So the loss of vertebrate host species that support parasites that infect a snail in common with the snail host for S. mansoni could have implications for transmission of this human parasite. Now, uh, in nature, when you go out and you begin to exhaustively look for the number of different kinds of parasites that are there, uh, you can find that, uh, in fact, these snails must simultaneously contend with lots of different kinds of parasites. And here I would like to uh, acknowledge the work of Martina Leidemann as a PhD student working in my lab. And she's done much of the fleshing out of all this diversity. So in our Biomphalaria species that are found in, in uh, uh, Lake Victoria and Biomphalaria sudanica, there we know there's at least, just simply based on morphology, in addition to S. mansoni over here, there's 15 other species of trematodes that compete for access to the same snail. And uh, these uh, transmission of these other trematodes, particularly from birds to biomphalaria species along the lake shore, can be intense. Imagine that these birds are infected with trematodes, in particular echinostomes. And uh, these pass eggs in the feces. Uh, the eggs will eventually hatch and infect biomphalaria. And one thing that will happen with these echinostomes is once they get into the snail, uh, the echinostomes produce a larvae called redia, uh, which have a mouth and a gut and will attach the intramolluscan stages of S. mansoni and eventually displace them. 
Then uh, Echinostome cercaria are produced. They insist in other snails, uh, which are then ingested by these birds. So uh, other kinds of species of vertebrates uh, actually can play a protective role here by contributing parasites that uh, infect the snail, but in this case don't infect people. So here, just to show you uh, the echinostome and strygeid parasites that are found uh, in snails around uh, Lake Victoria, uh, have a much higher prevalence, about 6 to 5% in these snails, much higher than uh, prevalence of S. mansoni, which is uh, less than, than 1%. And again, part of what Martina has been working on, I'll just show you this very briefly, is, is uh, doing the molecular work on all these different echinostomes that are found in the lake. And uh, what we now know is there's at least uh, 20 different species of echinostomes that are transmitted right there in and around the lake or in some of the streams near the lake, many of which, if you go down this list, uh, will infect biomphalaria snails and potentially could interfere with S. mansoni transmission. Now, I also just briefly wanted to talk about what's going on in the streams because there we see a little bit more of an impact with cattle. And um, if we look at some of the stream habitats, uh, we find again that biomphalaria pfeifferi there is frequently transmitted with an amphistome parasite. And in fact, it's the most common parasite in the hab habitat, uh, somewhat more, a little bit more common than S. mansoni. And uh, again, uh, Martina has looked at uh, the various kinds of amphistomes that are present in Kenya. And all I want to uh, say right here is right now it looks like there's at least 16 different amphistome species found circulating in and around Lake Victoria in Kenya. So there's a considerable diversity of them. And I just wanted to uh, point out one species in particular, something called Calicophorin sucari. Uh, this is that one very common amphistome species that we have found. And it's, it's very peculiar. We know that it's common there among snails in the habitat. And uh, just a couple things that, that I wanted to point out. Imagine if we go to a particular stream and we re remove some snails and we just uh, let them sit in the lab. At some point, a few of those snails may have uh, pre-existing infections of mansoni or amphistomes. However, if you take some of those snails and expose them to S. mansoni, uh, one of the very odd things that happens is sure enough, some of them do become, uh, are more likely to become infected with S. mansoni. But one of the things that was very peculiar is we learned that those snails that we take from the field that are not shedding anything, uh, at least yet, if we expose them to S. mansoni, often what would then emerge from these snails are the amphistomes. And so many non-shedding field snails, when exposed to S. mansoni, later shed amphistome cercaria many more than observed among snails that were not exposed to S. mansoni. And this really perplexed us. We couldn't figure out quite what was happening here. Put in one parasite and out will come a different one. And uh, we have since done uh, studies with experimental infections here to confirm this. And basically, if you do the experiments with lab reared snails, we find that the amphistome, if you infect the snail, has very little ability to infect the snail on its own. If you do the same thing with S. mansoni on its own, it can initiate a very high infection rate. But if you put the two parasites together, then what you see will happen if uh, they're exposed either simultaneously at different intervals that inevitably what happens is that the overall success of S. mansoni will decline and the uh, abundance of calicophorin sucari, the amphistome, uh, increases. 
And basically, uh, what we think is going on here is when we look in this habitat and see a successful amphistome infection, we're really seeing an indication of a preempted Mansoni infection. So if we take a snail and expose it to Mansoni, many of those snails will become infected with Mansoni cercaria. If we take a lab snail and expose it to amphistomes, the, these amphistomes are derived from cattle, uh, then very few of them will take the infection. If we take some of the snails and first expose them to amphistomes and later expose them to Mansoni, what we discover is most of those snails then shed amphistomes. So somehow S. mansoni is f facilitating the development of this cattle parasite. And furthermore, if you let this go over time, inevitably what will happen is you may end up with a snail that's shedding cercaria of both species, but almost inevitably what will happen is the mansoni will disappear and the amphistome will usually then take over the S. mansoni infection. Uh, so when you look to find uh, double infections of amph amphistomes and S. mansoni occurring together, uh, what you find is the number of them occurring together is much less than what you'd expected by chance. So in fact, uh, this is part of a series of studies that can be pieced together where we can look at the different trematodes that are found in this system and actually develop a dominance hierarchy that you can see here where uh, we have some losers over on this side. Uh, if uh, a Zyphidio cercaria occurs in a snail and later the snail is infected with a strygeid, the strygeid will take over. If S. mansoni is in a snail, it's exposed to an amphistome, the amphistome will take over. If an amphistome is in a snail and exposed to an echinostome, eventually the echinostome will take over. So uh, mansoni only does in the middle here in terms of its overall performance. So the implications for this uh, is the number of S. mansoni infections in snails are being diminished by both bird-transmitted echinostomes, as in Lake Victoria, by intrasnail competition or predation, and by domestic uh, ruminant-transmitted amphistomes, as in streams. And this occurs both by intrasnail competition or predation and by a facilitation effect where the amphistome is so successful only because S. mansoni is successful. And if we take this into account, when we look at the number of amphistome and S. mansoni infections in our snails, if the amphistome were not there, then the number of S. mansoni infections in these habitats would probably be much higher, may even be double. So one of the things that we're trying to do is figure out how to embellish and exploit some of these uh, competitive interactions for control. Uh, by trying to domesticate some of these parasites and use them in particular locations where transmission might be uh, of mansoni to people might be high. Now, I have just a couple minutes left. Um, what I wanted to do is just come back and talk a little bit about the theme of how domestic animals participate in human infectious disease in several different ways. And uh, think about this particular life cycle of a tapeworm, uh, Tania solium or Tania saginata. Uh, here we have a particular kind of life cycle where uh, because humans predictably eat bovines or uh, uh, swine, certain parasites have taken advantage of this for their own transmission and have uh, have uh, used domestic animals as intermediate hosts. Uh, here's another example where particular kinds of parasites like fasciola develop in cattle or sheep as definitive hosts and are so successful in these hosts that often the infection spills over into humans and we end up with fasciola infections, uh, the adult worms occurring in people. Um, 
This is similar to what happens in the case of S. japonicum, where we have a zoonotic affection similar to what's going on with fasciola hepatica. Here's another example, and this one is true for S. hematobium uh, that's causing urinary schistosomiasis in people. I haven't talked so much about that one. And uh, so a related species like schistosoma bovis that occur in cattle. Well, it turns out one of the things that we're learning, uh, this is work done by Joanne Webster. That's my indication to stop, so I know I'm running out of time here. Um, is that cattle actually end up being an incubator for where uh, hybridization of these parasites can occur. And what's coming to light, if you look in cattle in certain parts of Africa, uh, they're frequently hosts for worms that are hybrids between hematobium and bovis. So cattle can serve as mixing bowls in which uh, genetic diversity of parasites can be uh, altered. And then finally, with the amphistome, I just wanted to say that uh, these amphistome parasites, parasites that cycle through cattle are found in the rumen, are very abundant in uh, species, and they're numerically abundant. They colonize the same host as schistosomes. They compete with and displace schistosomes in snails. And they seem even to achieve the state of dependency on schistosomes for their development. So uh, to then summarize, uh, I just wanted to make the point that schistosomiasis exists within a very complex setting. In some cases, the diversity can work to favor transmission by providing alternative snail and mammalian hosts and alternative modes of transmission. Uh, however, the diverse vertebrate hosts in the environment, including domestic animals, can support parasites that compete with S. mansoni for access to its needed snail host. And uh, these predictable interactions between humans and domestic animals create many opportunities for parasites, whether it's uh, predation of ruminants, zoonotic cycles, hybridization, or here we provide another example of facilitation where one group of cattle parasites, the amphistomes, exploit the infectivity of S. mansoni for snails to its own benefit. And this all comes back to a very predictable contamination of common environments and common hosts leading to uh, this facilitation phenomenon. Um, and uh, before I quit, I'd just like to acknowledge a couple Japanese colleagues, uh, Dr. Shinichi Noda and Dr. Ryushi Uchikawa, who both worked in my lab several years ago when I was first getting started and were very helpful for me in getting my program off the ground. And then I'd also like to thank uh, the organizers of the Creativity Forum. I'd like to thank my colleagues in Kenya and the US uh, for their involvement in this project. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the NIH and the Gates Grand Challenge uh, Program for support. And if any of you have any um, kinds of questions, penetrating and illuminating or otherwise that you'd like to ask me, I'll try my best to answer. Thank you very much.